Nine will learn about caring for roses during the growing season. When those flowers have faded, it's a good idea to remove them. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications. Welcome to Garden Line. I'm Stephen Monk. Tonight on our show, we pay, pay a visit to Macquarie Gardens with Extension Horticulturalist David Graper to learn about caring for roses. Dave will share tips on pruning and fertilizing roses. And as always, our panel of lawn and garden experts are here to answer your questions with the most up-to-date information about gardening, lawn care, insect, trees, and a host of other lawn and garden-related concerns. So get ready to call in. The phone number for you to call in is 1-866-595-SDSU. Again, that is 1-866-595-7378. Joining me in the studio to answer your questions is John Keycafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, David Graper, Extension Horticulturalist, Leon Reggie, Retired Extension Weed Specialist, and K.C. Jensen, SDSU Wildlife and Fishery Sciences. Helping to answer the phones tonight are the folks from the Watertown Master Gardeners. And remember, when you call in with your questions, please provide our phone volunteers with as much about your garden problem as you can. Be ready to provide a description of the problem, when the problem first appeared, whether it's affecting any other surrounding plants, and the moisture and soil conditions that exist. But first off, we're going to go around the table to hear from our panel on what is currently happening out there. And we're going to start tonight with John Keycafer, Insects. Insects. I brought in a few tonight that are just a little bit different. Uh, these are ones that a lot of people maybe want to see in their garden, things that you'd enjoy having around. Brought in some images of some dragonflies, and, and we get a lot of people who try to garden a little bit for butterflies, and we talk some about birds, in case he's a lot better at that than I am, but uh, um, you know, sometimes people plant things specifically for certain creatures like that, and dragonflies are one of those neat things that are fairly easy to attract to a garden and to other settings as well around the yard. And so I've, I've got some images just of some of the common ones that you might be seeing in gardens right now. Most of these are skimmers. This is one of our, our smaller black and yellow skimmers that uh, you'd find in a garden. Um, we see a number of species of dragonflies that'll hang out in gardens and, and uh, find insects to eat there. And the neat thing about all the dragonflies and damselflies that we have is that these things are all uh, predatory. They eat other insects. Most of them they catch on the wing, which means they eat a lot of mosquitoes, a lot of gnats, uh, flies, things like that that are easy to see in the air flying and, and chase down and catch. Kind of unique among insects, if you really pay close attention to dragonflies in flight, they can move each wing independently. They don't have them linked together in any way, so each wing flaps independently. That lets them fly sideways, backwards, upside down, any which way they choose to fly, they can go ahead and fly. And uh, as far as attracting them in a garden, you want a variety of plants, they're going to need that food source there. And a lot of people worry about having a pond there for them to, uh, to grow up in. The larvae of all of these are aquatic and live underwater. Ponds are nice. If you do have a pond and want to raise some that way, what you're going to be looking for in that case is you're going to want to, to make sure that you don't have it so clean or that you remove everything so often that you're removing those larvae with it. You want to make sure that you give them a nice place to live, give them a chance to grow up. As far as the adults, you just want to make sure they have enough insects around to eat. And for most of us here, we have enough mosquitoes to, to share with them and have plenty left over. So if you have some of those around, give them a diversity of plants, some hiding places, uh, some shelter, 
some shade and things like that and, and places to get out of rain and, and strong winds and chances are they'll show up in your garden. You mentioned giving them time to hatch. Is there right. like days you could throw onto that time frame or? It depends very much on the species. You know, the little blue one that I had up here is actually a damselfly. It's in the same order, but smaller, more fragile looking insect. Those things can complete development relatively quickly, a matter of a few weeks to a few months. Some of the large dragonflies will take a full year. Uh, some of them may take longer than a year, depending on conditions and uh, they need that aquatic environment during that entire time. So add water to your, whatever, your pond or your Right, yeah, your don't let it dry don't, don't, don't uh, drain it, okay. Right. just continue yep. to add And water. if you start removing all of the vegetation at times, you know, people worry about getting some of that algae and some of those other plants out of there. If you do end up removing a lot of those plants, try to leave enough of them to give some hiding places to those larvae there. Uh, quick question, last year though, I noticed there were just large numbers. People were calling in and uh, even going down the interstate, I know one night, it, you could just see them kind of like a cloud coming by your car, like you're in a snowstorm almost. Right. Yeah, you know, the neat thing about dragonflies in that respect is that they can fly tremendous distances. Some of the dragonflies have been collected out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and they can't live in the Pacific Ocean, so they're flying from one continent to another. Uh, same thing here, they can just get up in the air and keep flying as long as weather conditions are right. And they'll often move in front of storms, and you get those pressure fronts uh, moving, storm systems moving through. It'll carry some of them aloft and they just ride those currents in front of there and you get these clouds of dragonflies moving through. Okay, good. Uh, we talked about water in the, like in a pool or bird bath or something. Will they eat mosquito larvae that's in there? They itself? will eat mosquito the, the, larvae. The larva yeah. will eat the larva? Yes, they okay. will. They'll eat each other too. Uh, okay. They are cannibalistic. Takes more water than a bird bath. So okay. don't figure that you're going to okay. get by with a bird bath. You don't really need to have water right there. The images that you saw tonight were taken in a garden where there is not a, a proper pool for these things to live within a quarter mile. So they'll move into an area even if you don't have it ideal for them right there. Okay. Thanks, John. David, what do you have for us tonight? Well, I missed the show last week because I was out in <clears throat> Pennsylvania attending the uh, American Public Gardens Association annual conference. So we got to tour some fantastic botanic gardens out on the East Coast. There's a lot of great places to see around Philadelphia. So I'd encourage you, if you ever get out to that area, besides all the historical sites, you know, the only thing I think really historic that I got to see was Betsy Ross's house, and that just was pointed out <laughs> by the tour guide. But uh, there's a whole host, there's like 20 major botanic gardens out in that area and the ones that I got to were Scott Arboretum and Longwood Gardens and Winterthur and well, I can't even think of all of them but it was just absolutely fantastic and gave us lots of great ideas of things that we can bring back and try to implement back here in our own McCroy Gardens which uh, I was out touring the uh, New Education and Visitor Center today and it's really coming along, they're working on the parking lot right now and finishing up some of the work on the inside so it's not quite up to the standards of Longwood Garden and some of those places out there, but we're going to try to keep making it a, a bigger and better garden mm -hmm. as time goes on here. One step at a time, yep. we're getting closer. We'll so. take little pieces up from, yeah. we'll steal what we can from other people, and that's one of the great things about horticulture. And I think for all of you gardeners out there, you're, you'll find that people are more than willing to tell you their little secrets and their little tricks and things to make things grow better and, and have success. And the, the same thing applies up in the Public Garden Institute, Institutes as well. Okay, good. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. Leon, good to see you. Well, I mean, it's good to see everybody, but we haven't seen Leon for a while, so. Yeah. <laughs> he showed up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, pinch hitting for Mike. He's uh, busy with some tours of some of the research work that's going on, so it's good to be able to check back with the panel and with our gardeners to kind of get an idea of what's going on around the state. I'm sure that uh, we really are experiencing some extreme conditions. There's some really good things happening that I hear about, gardens that got in early, uh, some of those cool season crops, it's just been great. And uh, then we've got some things like uh, we've dealt with where there's three and four or five inches of rain, I think we're seeing some other issues with gardening. But uh, as far as uh, weed control, uh, from the lawns, I, I think we're, we're kind of past all the spring weed control efforts and given in most areas of the state, I think the grass is just doing extremely well and that goes a long way as far as, as, as weed control at this point in the, in the season. Um, 
If you uh, did some new seeding, uh, again, it was a pretty good spring to get those things going. If you have some weeds and so forth coming up in there, I know they always look really weedy and you think, boy, the grass isn't going to make it. But especially with broad leaves, if that grass gets some growth, you can uh, clip it. And if you do that so it doesn't smother it, and if we keep the moisture on there, uh, that'll go a long ways. And we really don't try not to get in there with a whole lot of heavy-duty spraying until uh, the grass has been cut a couple of times or we get four or five leaves on it. Um, it just, as long as the grass can get going, things, things really go well. Uh, so, you know, in the, in, in the garden side, uh, weeding is always important. Uh, we're going to get to the point where some mulching and so forth is going to help as the vine crops start to uh, start to spread. But one of the things that uh, in our particular area, and, and I think some other gardeners where they've had some flooding problems, we're really seeing some kind of unusual response on garden plants that almost mimic some of the growth regulator herbicide. We get a lot of abnormalities and wilting and this kind of thing. In our case, our garden has gone underwater at least twice and things like potatoes have just rotted. I had a few tomatoes in there, a few of the potatoes that came through actually wilted. And for, you know that really reminds me when we talk about those plants that are wilted, they're really just kind of smothered. I mean, they're just, it, it's, it, it's a, one of those biological things that we don't very often see a plant responding, but there's just no air, and they wilt down, and we're seeing some on tomatoes. I've seen this a couple of times. I, I think some of these stresses, you can get some leaf abnormalities that mimic maybe some of the growth regulators on, as the new leaves unfold. And I try to think that there's a difference there because Generally, with these stress things like we're seeing, the, the leaves will roll, or you could say they curl. But when we get some of the growth regulator herbicides like you used for dandelions or spray in the wind after the tomatoes and flowers and things are in, it'll tend to cause some abnormal cell division, maybe some wide veins or some distorted, uneven growth, and generally stress itself doesn't really do that. Now that, that can be a little hard to sort, but I think folks uh, this time of year we start looking a lot of those plant symptoms and don't forget um, some of these stress issues are going to make some plants look a bit differently for a while. Hopefully now I know we've got some warm weather, in fact hot days coming, things will probably straighten out and uh, hopefully we'll get back going again because a lot of folks really just finished getting some gardens in in, in places and some are doing very well. The yeah, if it was wet enough to where those roots actually died back, it'll take a little time for those plants, if they aren't dead, to recover, I suppose, for the roots to reestablish. I've been watching a few of the plants, and uh, it takes maybe three, four days. And then, you know, uh, you, you get a little bit full, you think, here, we, we had some bright sunshine. So, oh, now I'll go out here this afternoon, and, and things will be up. No, it's just the other way. The top part of the plant is going like summer's here and I got to take off and it can't do anything about it from the roots. They're still waterlogged or, 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 or been, been uh, destroyed, yeah. rotted off. And it'll be kind of interesting with all the rain we've had and runoff, how in some cases we relocate certain uh, weed species as far as seeds flowing and getting caught in a residue that is bunched up and along the, well, yeah. streets, uh, creeks or rivers and so on. So, yeah. Uh, It'll be interesting in the future sometimes if we relocate. I think some along of these with uh, stress symptoms, there's some chapters in some of those uh, books about uh, weed dispersal and yeah. redistribution. <laughs> and uh, boy, we're going to see a bunch of that yeah. both in town and yeah. in the countryside this year. So, very good. Thank you, Leon. You Casey, what do you have for us tonight? Well, I, I've uh, changed uh, uh, gears just a little bit. I want to talk to pet owners uh, about cats. Um, and, and having cats around your place. Uh, I've got some, some photos here and, and it's, uh, it's one of those deals I, I think people don't always really think about. You know, only about a third of, of pet cats uh, in the country today are actually in, indoor cats. That means two thirds of them get out and they're wandering around. And this can cause lots of issues as if you're a bird and trying to live in, in the yard. Uh, and also for people that like pets, uh, the life of a cat living outside or a feral cat that really has no home, I don't think is really very good or certainly not very pleasant. Um, uh, some studies uh, have shown that in urban environments and, and in some rural environments that uh, um, 
the, the majority of diets, for instance, of great horned owls in some instances is made up of cats. Mm. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's not a very good end if you're a cat lover or a cat for that. <laughs> But uh, a rec some recent work is, is showed in Wisconsin alone, uh, about seven million birds per year, this is just during the breeding season, are killed by uh, feral or outdoor house cats. Uh, here's a picture of a little gray one with a barn swallow. Um, and these take all kinds of birds. Uh, the, I think the next uh, slide is one of a yellow rumped warbler which is one of our most common migrant warblers here. It's an early, early migrant warbler, both in the spring and the fall. And the next, uh, next slide shows a cat actually taking uh, a yellow rumped warbler right out of the bird bath. Uh, and it kind of uh, points to the fact that in the U.S. alone, uh, annually, we figure that there's between 150 and 200 million birds per year that are killed by house cats. And so the take-home message I'd like uh, for our listeners or watchers or, or viewers tonight to, to have is to you know, keep fluffy inside. Uh, bells don't always work. Uh, just, just keep the cat inside. Okay, good. <laughs> I thought maybe you were going to get into the cat and dog issue of which is better. But no, I won't go there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Casey. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing how many uh, birds actually those, those cats can take down. So. Yeah. Yep. So, good. Well... Thanks for the round table, but we're also here to answer some questions, and we have some that have come in. So, uh, The first one here, uh, John, uh, choke cherry bush from Haiti. There's a lot of flat green caterpillars on my choke cherry bushes. What can I do, and is there a spray? The kids and I have been picking them off. Well, if you've got time to do that, that's not a bad way of getting rid of some of those things. Um, we've got a number of green caterpillars that will feed on trees and shrubs like that. I don't really want to speculate on which one it is for sure, but there are some products out there that will take them off if, if that's what you're looking for. You want to get rid of those caterpillars and quickly and easily and not spending the time to pick them off one at a time that way. Um, you know, several products out there, you want to make sure that whatever you're looking for is labeled for fruit tree use and that you respect that pre-harvest interval. So if you go into your local hardware store, your local uh, nursery supply, you know, any of those places. Um, take a look at what's available. Hard to say what's available in different towns, but uh, look for what's available and check that pre-harvest intervals to make sure that you've got enough time to get it on there and still get that crop off that you're looking for. The other thing that is out there that can be used on some of those are some of the biological agents. There are some bacterial products out there, some of the BT products that are out. Um, Dipel is one of them, um, Zentari is another one, and these are actually toxins taken from bacteria that kill caterpillars and won't kill some of the other things. Unfortunately, most of them are very difficult to find locally. You're probably going to end up ordering those, but relatively safe compared to a lot of the other chemicals, and they do, are fairly effective against most of the caterpillars. So we're clear on this. Define pre-harvest interval. Uh, Pre-harvest interval is that amount of time between when you make that application and when you can safely harvest the crop on there. So a lot of times what you'll see is a you know 48 hour re-entry interval which means you spray that area you shouldn't re-enter without protective clothing on for 48 hours. Then there's also the pre-harvest interval which is usually a little bit longer. In a lot of these cases it may be seven days and that's just from the time you spray until you can safely harvest that crop and consume it would be seven days. It time. doesn't mean spraying, picking it, and letting it sit somewhere for seven days, no. right? It okay. means leaving it on that tree or that shrub and letting it weather, letting the rain and whatever else take some of that chemical off and letting it degrade in the environment. Okay. Uh, David from DeSchmidt, when is the best time to transplant peonies and iris? Well, we're going to be approaching that best time for iris here. In fact, if your iris have finished blooming, um, now is a good time to go ahead and transplant those. Uh, the peonies generally want to wait until later in the season, usually in the month of September, we say is a good time to transplant peonies. So iris from now until early fall, peonies wait until the month of September. Okay. Uh, Beersford, pepper plants, anything to promote 
growth. They're really not growing, and they're actually a little yellow, they say. So it might be getting back a little bit yeah, of what you're... <laughs> yeah, some of the things that Leon talked about with the cold soil temperatures and with all the moisture we're seeing, probably some nitrogen deficiencies showing up on some of these plants. They did flower twice. That's well, said, but that's good. Yeah. I think some getting some warmer weather and for things to dry out is probably going to be the, the best thing that we can see for peppers. Peppers like the heat, and they don't want to be sitting in wet, soggy soils. So I think just give them some time, and I think they're going to come around. Yep. With any consolation, I think there's a number of people who have commented that the peppers, they've got the terminal buds are there. There'll be one or two flowers, but the plants really haven't developed, and you're, I think, right, right spot on with the temperature and the wet mm -hmm. peppers. In fact, the last couple of years have been a little bit tough mm -hmm. in some areas to really get the growth on peppers that you'd like to have. Right. Okay. Hosmer, they have tulips. I need to redo my flower bed. Is it okay to dig up the tulip bulbs now or replant them and replant them, or do I dig them up now and replant them in the fall? Well, tulips, generally think of planting those in the fall. Uh, if you're going to try to transplant them, the best thing that you can do is to wait until that foliage turns yellow and turns brown and dies down on its own. That's going to be a, a cue to you that that bulb has got as much stored carbohydrates as it's going to get. So it's going to be in its best condition to provide a good tulip flower for next season. So if you want to dig them out, if you've got decent soil conditions, you can go ahead and replant them right away. Uh, or if you want to store them in a, a relatively cool, dry place until September, early October, something like that, you can replant them then too. It's, it's really up to you how you want to do it. Okay. Hey, Ty, strawberries. John, strawberry patch that gets wire worms. They burrow into the strawberries when they ripen. The worm is dark tan, and several of them are on each strawberry. 75% of the patch is infested, and... Uh, if this makes a difference, the strawberry patch is five years old. Yeah, I don't think that makes too much difference in this case. And this is one of those where the common names end up confusing things a little bit. So for anybody watching, if you look up wire worms, you'll find that wire worms are a pest of grasses, wheat, corn, oats, uh, a lot of those small grain type uh, crops. Wire worms truly are larvae of click beetles those elotarids that you see, the ones that when you flip them on their back, they make that click sound and pop up in the air. I think what they're actually finding on the strawberries in this case are millipedes. Uh, people end up calling them wire worms a lot. Millipedes are not insects at all. They're not worms and they're not insects. And uh, they get into a lot of different areas like this. They'll end up feeding on a lot of different horticultural tissue, vegetative tissue and they'll do a number on strawberries. I know I've seen them on some strawberries in the last week, um, other fruits as well. As far as trying to control them, that's gonna be fairly difficult. They're really a symptom of our cool, wet weather this spring. And if we can uh, get rid of some of that cool, wet weather, chances are you'll see some of that millipede damage going away. As far as getting rid of them, it's one of those where honestly your, your mulch on the strawberries is gonna encourage them. If you have less of that, it'll favor getting rid of them. Um, you know, the plastic between strawberry lines will help on that. If the strawberries are resting on plastic, you can reduce some of those numbers that way. Other than that, I don't have a great solution on how to get rid of them. Uh, harvesting before they're fully ripe, would that make any difference here? It could, like, although if they're short of food, they may end up eating some unripe ones too. Okay. They're not that fussy about them. They're hungry, they're hungry. So if you can get those strawberries up off the ground a little bit, take away that easy avenue for them to have access to them. That will help some too. Okay. Uh, this one comes to us Wyoming. They have a, it's a two-part question. Uh, Dave, does it really help to add gypsum pellets to the garden soil to help with compaction? Uh, when and how to add, if that is a suggestion. Then we have another follow-up question that deals with mulch, but if you want to do the gypsum one here first. So. Well, gypsum is something that can help with compaction, uh, especially if you have high sodium content in your waters. And I know West River, we can have some very high sodium content in our water out there. And gypsum can help to alleviate some of that compaction, that crusting that you get with some of that. Uh, as far as how to apply it, I'd say just broadcast it. Uh, there should be some directions on the bag as far as how much to use. I, I don't know what the rates are off the top of my head, but I'd say just broadcast it and then incorporate that into the soil to get the best activity from it. It's been interesting as I've been looking in hardware stores and so forth. I'm always going to the hardware stores for one thing or another, either for McCrory or for at home. 
And I've seen a lot more limestone showing up in, in garden centers and um, hardware stores and so forth around here. Lime is probably one of the last things that you want to buy. Even though you might read books and talks about the importance of liming and adding lime to your soil, for us, we don't need it. Gypsum, on the other hand, will provide some calcium. I think it's calcium sulfate, isn't it? Calcium, yeah. Yep, that's right. Um, so you're going to get some calcium, you're also going to get some sulfur. It's essentially a neutral product. It doesn't really affect pH too much. If you put lime on, that's going to tend to raise the soil pH, and in general, our pHs are pretty good or on the, on the high side, so adding lime is going to make that problem worse. So if you want to add something, get some extra calcium, get some sulfur in there, now, those can be nutrients that we need in our plants. Uh, gypsum isn't too bad. Okay. The second part deals with uh, mulch, as I mentioned. They really would like to know advantages or disadvantages, or if one's better than the other as far as shredded cedar versus cypress mulch. Well, one of the considerations, I, I like using both, but I prefer uh, the shredded cedar bark or cedar mulch for one important reason and that there's lots of cedar trees out there and it's a renewable resource that there's plenty of them out there. Cypress on the other hand, are, on the other hand is, are getting uh, kind of slim and few between in a lot of places and so the cypress mulch, you know, it's not quite as a renewable resource <laughs> as the cedar mulch. mulch. As far as long lasting and that sort of thing, they're going to both be very, very similar. They both resist decay pretty well and they both can have about the same appearance out in the garden. So it's really up to you, I guess. Okay. Does one hold better against windy conditions and all that? Well, pretty much the same, same, typically, in my experience. I've used both, and I guess uh, you might just say, well, which one's cheaper, and go with that one. Okay. <laughs> there we go. This one comes from uh, Sioux Falls, Bayberry Bush. The leaves are yellowing, and the shoots have a browning in the vascular structure. He wonders if they have a disease such as Dutch elm disease, and what would be the treatment, or is there anything that they can do, or can it even spread? The hedge is 30 years old, and the disease seems to be getting a little worse as time goes on. But and this is bayberry? Bayberry bush is what they, they say here. Bayberry bush hedge is how it's titled. All right, I'm not familiar with any bayberry bushes even in South Dakota, and I might be completely wrong on that, okay. but that's a new one for me. I'm not familiar with bayberries here in South Dakota, certainly in other parts of the country, but especially one that's 30 years old, I'd be real surprised. Maybe it's a barberry? Could be what they're referring to if it's got thorns yeah. along the stems. Yeah. That could very well be what it is. And again, this yellowing that you're talking about gets back to what we've been talking about earlier. Wet, soggy soils, you're going to get uh, nutrient deficiencies showing up. Iron, manganese can be possibilities. Nitrogen can be a possibility. So again, just have to kind of wait for things to dry out and warm up, and I think those symptoms are going to diminish. So it would be barberry if it has like stickers on the stems right, right. and kind of a darker purplish color yeah, or sometimes be, green. I mean, it can there's go. a variety of barberries out there yeah. and, and those certainly I would believe that they might have one that's 30 years old, but <coughs> bayberry, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, hibiscus plant here, John. White flies and hibiscus, how do you get rid of them? Uh, they kept it inside, they try to keep it inside year round, blooms and looks healthy. Uh, it does have a few leaves that drop, of course. But. Right, yeah, that's kind of the the perennial question with hibiscus, if you're growing them here, as soon as you put them outside, they seem to be a magnet for whitefly. And if you look on the underside of those leaves, they're just coated with whiteflies. You know, simple things that you can do, just even uh, washing those off with a, I don't want to say high pressure hose, but you know, some water under some pressure will knock a lot of those off. Insecticidal soap works well on those sorts of things. Um, you know, we end up with a number of products that will knock out white flies, but the trick with any of those insecticides that would be labeled against them is to make sure that you get it up under the underside of the leaves. If you're just putting it on the surfaces, you may be missing most of them. The other thing, if you could find one that would be taken up through the root system, especially if it's a container type plant, you can treat fairly easily that way, treat that soil and have it taken up through the plant and hopefully get to them that way. Okay. Casey, Sioux Falls. Mice are getting into my house through the unfinished furnace room. They chew through the insulation near the floor joist and come into the kitchen. How do I keep them out? I have heard of using steel wool to plug the hole, or should I use decon around the perimeter of the house? Help. Um, <clears throat> you know, anytime uh, you have rodent issues coming in, it, it, they can come in in very, very small holes. And so caulking 
uh, does wonders a lot of times uh, to, to caulk even very small like a one half inch gap uh, most uh, mice can can get through that uh, if you have larger holes for instance where uh, like a, a, a utility line is coming in through the through the basement wall uh, or your your uh, air conditioning system make sure that that uh, area around that that uh, cord or, or pipe coming in is plugged well, caulked well. If you have a big, uh, a large hole, I would, uh, from the inside, maybe cover it with hardware cloth. You can buy some very fine mesh hardware cloth that rodents can't get through. Uh, and, and then... Mesh vents is what you're talking about there. Yeah. Yeah, hardware cloth. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think it has maybe a, a, you know, a quarter inch uh, screen like thing. And, and mice can't get through that, uh, and so that that's a you know that's a good deterrent as well if you have a large hole. But otherwise, a lot of times it's just caulking those gaps. Plus, it's going to help you on your utility bills. Traps. You can always trap them. Yeah. You know. Some traps. Yep. I was in a, a, a workshop one time. They were talking about at certain times of the year, especially with female mice, that they will look for nesting material over food. Yes. And so sometimes at the right times of the year, using like dental floss or something like that would be more encouraging uh, them into the traps than peanut butter or oatmeal or cheese. Oh, or for, anything. for yeah, for for trapping mice, uh, yeah, sometimes for, but you know, uh, cheese or uh, a mixture of peanut butter and oatmeal, I think, is hard for any mouse to uh, resist. Pass by. Yeah, <laughs> those cats are inside the house. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and if you have problem. indoor cats, you got to take care of. You got to take care of. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, Garden Line met up with extension horticulturalist David Graper at Macquarie Gardens Rose Beds. Dave demonstrates how to properly prune and fertilize a rose after the blooms have faded. Hi, I'm Dave Graper, Director of McCrory Gardens, and tonight we're going to talk a little bit about taking care of roses in your garden. A lot of people really enjoy growing roses. It's one of the most popular uh, garden plants that people have in their gardens, and there are many different types of roses out there, and right now we're seeing kind of roses at their peak, uh, especially some of the shrub rose varieties that we have out there, like the one that we have here, which is called John Cabot, which is actually kind of a shrub climbing rose. Uh, of course, we had some heavy rain last night, so some, we lost some of the color that it had, but it's been really a very beautiful rose uh, for the last uh, two weeks or so. And we still have more flowers showing up on the plant, so it's not quite done blooming yet. But we're getting to the point now where we got uh, a lot of heat and humidity, a lot of rain and so forth. That's the time that we're going to take a look at your roses and see how they're doing. One that you want to always check for are disease issues. See if you're seeing a lot of spotting and so forth showing up on the leaves. That may mean that you're going to need to use some fungicide treatments to try to help protect those roses from uh, future disease problems. Another thing we think about oftentimes, especially with hybrid tea roses, is that when those flowers have faded, it's a good idea to remove them, to give room for new flowers to come forth. On a shrub rose, we don't worry about that too much because we also can enjoy uh, some of the rose hips that will develop later on the, on the, the old stems, and those can give us some color in late summer and even into the winter months. But on a typical hybrid tea, we're going to cut down to a nice big five leaflet leaf or one that has even seven leaflets on it. And that's going to encourage those lower buds to break, form a new shoot, and give us additional flowers later on in the, in the summer. Another thing we always want to watch for are just dead growth in there, especially in the spring. It's a good idea to go through your roses, cut back any of the shoots that might have been damaged over the winter months, get those pruned out down near the base. And in the case of a shrub rose, Sometimes it gets so large that it's a good idea to do a little renewal pruning as well. Just take out some of those biggest, oldest shoots down near close to the bottom. If you do that before midsummer, that's going to encourage some new shoots to develop up from the base. So that will give you a bigger, uh, fuller rose down near the bottom, lots more flowers probably for that upcoming season. And that's going to give a good way to keep those roses the size you want them and keep them from getting too rangy and gangly and not have to worry about getting a thorny rose bush slapping you in the face as you walk through the garden. Other than that, a little fertilizer is also good. Uh, try to fertilize them early in the season. Avoid fertilizing later on in the year. You can use any of the rose type fertilizers that are out there or just a general 10-10-10 rose fertilizer or just everyday all-purpose fertilizer would also work quite well. Just scatter maybe about a half a cup around the base of the plant, scratch it into the ground a little bit, give it a good watering, and that should keep your roses going for the rest of the summer.
Well, thank you, David, for that information. So, You're and also I want to mention you're the director of Macquarie Gardens, so mm -hmm. you, that's. A good site for that and you're well versed in that. Now one thing I, I've noticed occasionally where they would make cuts or the prune cuts on roses where they put wax or uh, fingernail polish, is there anything to that? It's really not necessary. Uh, if you're pruning roses or pruning any kind of shrubs or trees, uh, again you're going to find those pruning sealers and pruning paints and so forth and like you mentioned other things that people try. Uh, the, the plant will chemically wall off those wounds or those cuts on its own, so adding things like that really aren't necessary. Okay, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Leon, this comes to us from Chamberlain. Is there any way to control Creeping Jenny? Uh, it's coming up through the straw mulch that's around her tomato plants. Uh, they've narrowed that down quite a bit. That's, a, that's a, gonna be a tough issue <laughs> for, the current, <laughs> for the current year. <laughs> And uh, creeping jenny or peel bindweed really does present an incredibly tough problem and it's just going to keep re redeveloping as the plant grows back from that underground system, especially in gardens because it's responding to the same tender loving care that we're given the tomato plant and so during the season it's going to be tough. Uh, for this season, the best thing that you can do is to keep removing the top growth because that's what's making the food and that's what's going to help build up those reserves and the root and it'll at least prevent the thing from really building up so that it becomes tougher for the next couple of years. So uh, keep the top growth off. Uh, probably every couple of weeks uh, there will be enough growth on there so that it starts making more food than what it's really using to produce the growth. Uh, if some, some real fall effort, uh, whether it's in this case in the garden after all the uh, produce has been harvested, if uh, there's good moisture in the fall and they get regrowth, that would be the time if they want to do some extra work on it. Uh, Roundup, for example, could be effectively used if they allow some several inches of growth on that vine. If you don't want to spray, at least go through and do a couple of tillage operations because that's going to also help weaken the underground part of that plant. We're dealing with something that probably is in the neighborhood of a ton or ton and a half of mass under an acre. And whatever portion of that you might have, uh, the garden is probably uh, doing as well with that. So uh, it, it is something that takes takes persistence. But um, certainly uh, around the tomatoes, it's a matter of, of, of just kind of holding it at bay mm -hmm. during <laughs> during this part. And uh, I think oh. they're doing, you know, the mulching and stuff is going to help with that as well as other weeds are doing what they can uh, given where they're at. Uh, you talked about roses, Dave. And we have a couple questions, one from Mitchell, one from Burke. Uh, the first one is, when is the best time to apply lawn insecticide granules? Uh, and, well, that, that's, yeah, we'll go over here for that. It's a lawn one. But then they also follow up coffee grounds around roses. So, so John, you want to talk about the uh, lawn insecticide granules, and then we'll come back to the roses in uh, coffee. Sure. Okay, we'll start with the lawn insecticide granules. This is really going to depend on what insect it is that you're targeting. And, you know, simple answer is that it's going to vary throughout the year depending on what you might have. If you're going after white grubs, you know, we're getting close to the time where you'd want to start thinking about putting some of that on for white grubs. If you're dealing with bill bugs or with other insects, you want to try to time that a little bit better to, to match their life cycle a little better. Um, so what we're really looking at is, first of all, figuring out what sort of insects you have there as a problem and then timing it to match their life cycle out there. So I think identification's first step on that one. That one, okay. And John, we're, we're timing that to go with the larvae, right? Is that? Correct, I yeah. Mean, they they and see the other well, and it's more than moth just, or something will be hopping around on some of yeah. those, and, I, and, and that's when we start thinking about it. It's, and it's more than just the larvae, because in the case of the white grubs, yeah, you once you get those big yeah. larvae, they're kind of hard to get out of there, but if you can get those, those little babies they're pretty simple to get, and so you want to stay ahead of them and, and get them so out. I always think like about that. it when I see the adult moth or something, going, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're at a right. treatable stage unless you're going to do something. The but adults are hard to kill. It's tricky to do the adult. Yep. That's right. Yep. Okay. The second part of that, Dave, was coffee grounds on roses. How often or how much? Well, coffee grounds, there's a lot of other organic kind of materials like that. Again, I wouldn't overdo it. Um, I'm not sure how heavy a coffee drinker you are, but. Uh, <laughs> 
some people can accumulate quite a few coffee grounds. I wouldn't, you know, put cups around a plant, but if you got a, you know, one pot's worth of coffee grounds and you sprinkle it around a plant, again, kind of work it into that soil a little bit, that's, that's probably going to be enough. Uh, if you have a compost pile, you can certainly add them to the compost pile. That's another good place for coffee grounds. You're going to get some organic uh, nutrients out of those, out of that kind of a material too. So a little bit is okay, but I wouldn't, you know, put it on an inch thick and think you're doing a great thing because you, you could get some problems with high salt content and that sort of stuff. So, okay. uh, The other one uh, comes from Mitchell Roses. They've had this for eight years. It's never bloomed or had blooms. It's the west side of the house, two feet from the foundation. Uh, they trim it in the fall down to 10 inches every fall, and they don't cone it in the wintertime. So any ideas on what they can do to perhaps... Well, if they've never seen flowers, uh, my first guess is that this is a hybrid tea rose and the top grafted or budded portion of the plant has died out. Uh, hybrid teas are notorious for that in our climate. We have a tough winter. Uh, University of Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, for example, every fall they dig a trench next to the rose plants and they tip them over in the ground and cover them up with soil. Then in the spring they dig them up and tip them back up again. And if you aren't doing that and you're not putting a rose cone on, which I'm not a real fan of rose cones either. Uh, it's very easy for that top growth to die out over the winter, and what you're getting are shoots coming up from the rootstock, which can be a very vigorous type of shrub rose. Uh, many times they don't have real pretty flowers, or they might not really flower much at all. They, those shoots can get six feet tall, I've seen on some of those. So it's growing like gangbusters, especially the leaves seem like they're kind of small compared to what you might see on a typical hybrid tea rose, and there aren't any flowers. I'd say the best option here is to dig it out and start with a new plant. I would suggest going with a shrub rose, uh, especially if you're not going to try to do a lot of uh, winter management of, of, of caring for that plant. If you're going to do a hybrid tea, I'd say think of it as a, a pricey annual flower that you enjoy for the summer and you replant it again the next year because it's just probably not going to survive unless you do some good mulching and really protect that plant over the winter. Okay, we're going to go for a trifecta here, and from Gregory, uh, roses, how do I start a rose bush <clears throat> from the rose bush she already has? Well, roses are actually not that difficult to root, and especially shrub roses. Uh, one of the, I mentioned just a moment ago about hybrid teas where you've got a, a portion grafted onto that rootstock. In most shrub roses, they are, gra they are growing on their very own roots. So you can take cuttings in the spring when the new growth comes out, uh, just take some cuttings of that new growth that's maybe two, three inches long, put a little rooting powder on it, put it in a little uh, plastic bag or a pot with a plastic bag over the top to provide some extra humidity, and you'll generally get them to root fairly easily. Even just sticking them in the spring, you probably could have just stuck them in the ground and they probably would have had enough moisture to get to root. Another thing that you can do is to just take a, a, a longer branch, bend that down to the soil, take a little piece of wire, make a hook out of it, and push that down to the soil put some soil over the top of the base of that, and that will probably also produce some roots. So there's several ways that you can do that. Uh, like I say, generally roses are fairly easy to, to root on like that. The hybrid teas, on the other hand, you probably have to go into budding and grafting and all that sort of thing, and that can get a lot more intensive. Okay, thank you. Well, we, we certainly encourage our viewers to call in, but throughout the week we also encourage uh, emails and letters uh, that have questions, and we uh, have some of those uh, this week as well. Uh, this one comes to us uh, by, from Brookings. Uh, they planted this tree at Lake Ponset last summer. Uh, water came up, and I thought the plant died because it was uh, in too much water. The tree came back this spring. Most of the tree is growing back above the grafting, is this tree going to be a hybrid tree yet, or is it going to uh, grow back as a crab apple tree? Any thoughts on that one? Well, I can't really see the graft union very well and see this new growth that they're talking about. Well, that's a little bit better image there. Uh, again, they hit on the, the key here. If that, those new shoots are coming from above that swollen crook in the stem down there near the soil line, that is the portion that was grafted onto it, so it's going to be the same variety that they purchased the plant to be. If those shoots come from below that, that's coming from the rootstock, and just like I talked about with the roses, you're not sure what you're going to get, whatever that rootstock happens to be. And then, as I mentioned, a crab apple. I don't know, it's some type of crab apple that they use as a rootstock, especially a dwarfing rootstock. So, if it's above the graft union, I'd say give it some time and see what it does. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple other ones too. We've got um, 
This particular one comes to us from, I am not sure. There's nothing on here that indicates that. So. Where is that in South Dakota? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. They just no location given given on the uh, on the sample or the the visual that we have here. Can you help me identify this plan? I ordered several bare root currants from a mail order nursery. This one was mislabeled, so I was reimbursed. Just wanted to know what it could be. It survived last winter, buried under the snow and has been thriving since, though there were not any blossoms this spring. Does that graphic uh, help us out at all as far as what it might be? Unfortunately, it doesn't help me out a whole lot. I, I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, if John Ball were here, he might be able to say, oh, that's certainly that's this plant, but I, I'm at a loss. <coughs> I don't know what the plant is. If we had a, a small sample of the plant with a twig with some leaves attached, we have a better chance of getting it identified for you. I just can't see it well enough from that image to give you a good answer as to what that plant might be. Looks like it might be a little chlorotic, though. It does look a little yellowish, but yellow. yeah. that could Darker be a variety. Rains. It could be. Yeah. It could be. Okay. Yep. Uh, Leon Parker, how do you control clover in a lawn? Uh, it's also fairly close to the garden. Well, I would. There are a couple of clovers, but commonly we're speaking about white clover, which uh, again will respond to some of the some of the weather conditions later on. Even when it gets droughty later on, and the grass kind of drops back, we'll often see the white clover uh, really look like it takes over. And I, uh, it's really not a particular serious weed problem in a lot of lawn sites, uh, actually. But if you're trying to maintain the, 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 the grass and, and get rid of all of the other broadleaf weeds, clover can be managed, I think, quite nicely with a fall uh, herbicide program. Um, it's a perennial plant and typical of, of those kinds of plants, and it being a broadleaf susceptible plant, uh, the same kind of thing that you basically do for dandelion control in the fall, where we talked before about the field bindweed of Creeping Jenny, allow for some extra growth so you've got some more leaf surface, and later in the fall, uh, after the garden and stuff, we don't have the risk that we do with flowers and garden, like they're mentioning there. Uh, even after a light frost, uh, white clover will be very effectively treated. And I would suggest if you want to want to treat, that's that's probably the way to hold off now. Okay. Work maybe with the change, garden. Maybe change perspective. White clover is one of those plants that I kind of like having in the yeah. lawn, and uh, seems like the more of it I want, the less of it I get. So maybe if you try to get more of it, you end up getting rid of it. <laughs> it keeps the bees happy, that's right. Okay, this one comes to us from Lincoln County. Fruit trees and fruit bushes. They bloom but did not pollinate. Is there a shortage of bees or is it too cold or too windy, too wet? Question marks. Any thoughts on that one? John or Dave? Can we answer it with a yes? Sure. <laughs> uh, to all the questions, or that's the first. Well, you know, part of it is when we start talking about these sorts of things on the bee side of it, we were short of bees at the time of year when the trees were blooming in most of South Dakota. We have two things that happen there. Most of the honeybees go south for the winter, and that's not by the bees' choice necessarily, but that's by the people who manage them. They all get hauled down to Texas and Florida and California, and they all end up in California for a month, and then they come back. They end up coming back normally right after apple trees are done blooming. So we don't have most of our honeybees in state at the time when our apple trees are blooming. This year, because of the timing of the apple bloom, uh, trees were delayed a little bit and the insects didn't get the memo, so they went ahead with their lives like nothing had happened. We actually ended up with a case where most of the mason bees were done. They had completed their development, they had finished up and were gone by the time the apple trees really hit full bloom. And those are great pollinators for apples, but if they're done and gone, they're out this year too. And most of our bumblebees weren't up to speed yet. So we were really a little bit short of pollinators for apples this year, but it's more of a specific to this year question than overall. We had some weather things that go on too, and I, I think Dave can probably handle those better than I can. Well, you know, again, we've had the wet conditions this year. We've had wet conditions last year. Uh, we've had some spring frost that can come into play there too. Uh, I'm not sure if they really had a, a really good display of flowers on the trees. Uh, my trees had very few flowers on them this year. 
And I think that relates back to some of the stress that they went through this past year and also some of those spring frosts can come into play there too. So if you have good flowering, then it kind of comes down to the pollinators if you haven't got any frost involved there. But there's not a whole lot you can do other than just provide good care for those trees and hopefully they're going to just be storing up a lot of energy this summer if they aren't too wet. But they'll put on a good show of flowers and hopefully lots of fruit next spring. Okay. Uh, Casey, uh, footnote to this one, she puts out great jelly to attract the Baltimore Orioles, mm -hmm. uh, but the king flycatcher sits by and catches the flies, I guess, that may come around the jelly. Oh. So, great. She's great. getting a yeah. double, double duty out yeah. of that. Yeah. And uh, this year I'm getting lots of reports of things other than Orioles coming into the jelly. Uh, I have lots of rose-breasted gross beaks, in fact, more gross beaks eating my jelly than I do Orioles. And a uh, neighbor uh, lady who lives over by Aurora is, is telling me she's got lots of catbirds and brown thrashers that are coming in right. and, and eating her jelly. So that's kind of a, an added bonus this year. And I hadn't heard that uh, before. So Can't beat great, great, jelly. Yeah, great deal. Yeah, it's the way to go. <laughs> well, let's go back to a couple other email uh, graphics that came in and questions that came mm -hmm. in. This one comes to us from uh, Rapid Valley. And could you please identify this weed for me? It is the most prevalent one in my area and quite a nuisance. What is the most effective spray to control this pest other than resorting to the Armstrong system? Hand pulling. <laughs> well, uh, they've shown a fair detail on the picture, so I think we can take a swing at it. Uh, that would very likely be prickly lettuce. It's not a particularly new weed plant. In fact, it's uh, really common around, especially in their area, but in a lot of areas around South Dakota. And uh, I would anticipate that this is a case where the seed is being parachuted in. This is one of, the, one of that family of plants that the seed can be carried quite a distance. So if they've got some sources for this, uh, this is no consolation, but it's probably going to be a, be a reoccurring issue with it. It is an annual. Uh, it will start up uh, normally fairly early in the spring, can start sometimes in the late fall, but early in the spring. And it's, it's, a, it's a broadleaf plant, so you could say, well, we could treat it like dandelion and that sort of thing, but I think it's a more difficult problem. Uh, if you do any herbicide work in the spring when the plant is fairly small, I think it would be quite effective. But what I find is that so often it's growing, and then if it's cut off with a mower, it has kind of a... Uh, a flattened base and those leaves are not very active and what I would hope is I guess that that if you've mowed it off and the growth is there uh, let's this year if we can keep the grass going uh, rather than trying to beat up that kind of already mowed off part of that plant uh, it's gonna that plant will disappear this fall when it freezes and you're probably gonna have a new crop of seedlings next year but it's broadleaf, can be treated if you're using some of that kind of work in the spring, you, you'll get some benefit from it, but um, it is a little more difficult. Does like the crabgrass preventer do any good for the seed production or the seed germination? Uh, generally not. Those are going to handle the grasses. This would be, uh, you would need something with some, some residual. The, the, the granular weed and feed products, if you're applying, if that's the way you're doing your weed, it's maybe not the best time for some of the other weeds, but if you're doing that, uh, that would be effective in the spring on any of those seedlings that, that had emerged. And in mm -hmm. this case, you would what if you prefer to have a wet so those granules. If you're going to use the granules. The trick there is that the granule has to be retained onto the leaf surface of the weed and dissolved so the chemical can be taken in, just as if you had used it in a liquid spray application. So that's that's how it's effective. So have dew or sprinkle lightly or something before you do it and uh, you could get some some help that way if if it's becoming a real issue. Okay, uh, the next one comes to us from Hitchcock and this is a leaf from a black-eyed Susan flower. They also see this on their Dianthus flowers. Uh, this is, uh, have been going on for two weeks. They sprinkle it with some seven powder. Uh, not uh, sure there is any improvement. Any ideas what we have here, gentlemen? Well, we Looked at this one and talked about it just a little bit. I think from the insect side of it, there are a couple notches out of the edges that may be insect related, but a lot of that damage to me looks like tattering from wind damage and mechanical damage on this one. Mechanical damage? Right, just brushing against other vegetation, getting slammed against other things in the wind and 
Not really anything related to insects, I don't believe. More so than maybe, well, would a disease happen to do this where we kill the tissue and then battering back and forth? And there are some diseases that will add to that quite a bit, and, and so that's a possibility. But I, I don't think we're dealing much with insects on there. There may be a few, but chances are the reason that the insecticide isn't working is because there aren't insects there to kill. Okay. And seven would be more of a stomach poison type of insect, wouldn't it, right. besides, so yeah. more so than a piercing or anything. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, good. Well, that's all the time we have for this evening. Just to let you know, Garden Line repeats twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting Digital Channel 3, also known as the Create Channel. The Encore broadcast can be seen Fridays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. Check your local listings to find SDPB Digital Channel 3 where you live. Now time to wrap up and thank our panel of experts. John Keekafer, Brookings County Extension Educator. David Graper, Extension Horticulturalist. Leon Reggie, Retired Extension Weed Specialist. And K.C. Jensen, SDSU Wildlife and Fishery Sciences. Thanks to our phone volunteers, the folks from the Watertown Master Gardeners, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. On behalf of the entire crew, have a good evening. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications.